Beyond the gates of the Ivy Hill Cemetery in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania are many stones and graves of the dearly departed. There is a grave there that people leave trinkets, toys, and flowers, so odds are the person leaving them never knew the person buried there in real life. A grave that only reads, America's unknown child. A boy whose name is unknown, whose life was tragically cut short. A boy found in an illegal dumping ground. A boy found wrapped in a linen blanket. A boy found inside a box. So unfortunately, the first time I heard of this case, it was from BuzzFeed Unsolved. But the one thing I hate is their constant joking, and I get it makes the mood light, but there's times that it's inappropriate. So if you really have a problem with that, please send hate comments to I don't care at I don't give a fuck dot com. So let's hop in the TARDIS and go back to 1957. In February of that year in the woods of Fox Chase, just north of Philadelphia, a young muskrat hunter named John, whose last name I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce, was checking his traps when he discovered a box for a bassinet. But inside the box wasn't a discarded baby bed, instead a naked body of a boy wrapped in a blanket. John decided not to report his findings because he didn't want his traps confiscated. Apparently, the area the box was found has a lot of traps and illegal hunting because several days later, a college student named Frederick J. Bananas saw a rabbit and decided to save Thumper from one of the traps. Also, apparently, people back then feared the police as much as they do now because Frederick also didn't really want to report the body to the police but ended up doing so anyways. Look, I get being wary of cops, but let's face it. Dead body of a boy. Even if you just looked and saw the body, you should report it. The police on the scene had hoped to identify the boy pretty fast, but that turned out to be wishful thinking. The boy was between three and seven years old. He was malnourished, dirty, and thin. His hair was matted and looked as though he had just gotten a haircut. And because there are sensitive people watching this probably, here's a video of a kitty before I go further in. This is their new toy. Oh, hi Reese. You can't see Rodan playing with it. You're blocking the blocking brother. Oh, there I think we've got it. Hi, buddy. Let the kitties remind you there's good in the world. Because this is gonna get a bit more fucked up. I know I haven't normally sworn in the past, but at this point, fuck it. I'm not being monetized and probably won't anytime soon. The boy's body was covered in surgical scars noticeable on his chin, ankle, and groin. He was covered in bruises as well. He was so malnourished his ribcage was visible through his skin. His feet and hands were wrinkled, suggesting that he was submerged in water before being dumped. In his throat was vomit, suggesting he threw up before he died. He was found in a box from J.C. Penney, a bassinet box. He was wrapped in a blanket, but he was nude. Due to malnutrition, his growth was stunted. The police fingerprinted the body and printed the feet to see if they could find a match in the local database, but nothing was found. This means he was more than likely birthed from home since there was no hospital records recovered from the prints. He seemed to have an eye ailment that he needed medication, but nothing came of that lead. The fact that he was circumcised, the moles he had on his body, and other distinguishable marks didn't lead to anything either. Time of death could not be estimated because of the weather at the time being cold and rainy. This would slow the process of the body's natural decomposition. Though it was more than likely a few days before the first discovery. The box had been dry when it had been raining weeks before. This meant that the box had to have been dumped recently and not in the last week. The medical examiner did though come up with a cause of death. Blunt force trauma. Weirdly, even though he was neglected and beaten, his fingernails and toenails were trimmed. So there was very little to go on and police released flyers around the Philadelphia area. Some even coming with gas bills. But they did find some things at the scene as well. A man's blue corduroy cap, a child's scarf, and a handkerchief with the letter G on it. A long brown strand of hair that didn't belong to the boy was also found. The cap had a stamp on it that led to a shop owner named Hannah Robbins. When asked, Robbins described a blonde-haired man between 26 and 30 who had no discernible accent. He had used cash to purchase it and she never saw the man again. So what about the other evidence? 
nothing ever came from them. They looked for physicians who could have treated the boy's old wounds. Nothing. They checked orphanages, foster care, even door to door. Nothing. Even the box, though it had identifying serial numbers that led to a specific store, didn't lead to anything. Then investigators decided to try a new tactic. They had a drawing of the boy dressed as a girl done. With the scarring on the genitals and the hastily done haircut, as well as the eyebrows seemingly stylized, the thought was that the boy was presented as a girl in public, and nothing came out of it. There are more scenarios people tried, but let's just say nothing came out of it. Because the boy is still unknown to this day, and if there was a break, we would have found out his name. And then maybe those would be worth talking about. But because this was a lot of heartbreak and sadness, let's take a moment to remember there's good in the world. So here's a video of a... the theories. The first theory is kind of wild in a way. In 1960, a man named Remington Barstow contacted a psychic about the case. The psychic told him to go to a particular address. This address happened to be a foster home run by Arthur and Catherine Nicoletti, as well as Catherine's daughter, Anna Nagel. He found there similar bassinets that came in the box the boy was found in, and blankets similar to the one the boy was wrapped in. Barstow developed a theory that the child was Anna's and that he was disposed of so Anna wouldn't be labeled as an unwed mother. This is circumstantial, but later Arthur would marry Anna Nagel. So that is weird. The second theory comes from a message by someone named M in 2002. M claimed that the boy's name was Jonathan and that her abusive mother purchased the boy from his parents in the summer of 1954. M then went into detail about the sexual abuse that the boy would receive from her mother and the extreme physical abuse. According to M, the boy had thrown up his dinner of baked beans so M's mother severely beat him and bashed his head on the floor. When M's mother was giving him a bath, he died. So these details match a lot of what the police knew, and at the time the police were the only ones to know these details. So it makes M's story seem legitimate. According to M, she was forced to dump the body after as well. The police, though, were unable to verify her story, even though a lot of it adds up. There is another theory that the boy's parents were carnival workers, which explains the lack of a paper trail. One that BuzzFeed Unsolved featured was a man who claimed to rent a place from a man who sold his son, which connects to the second theory. But that's the only theories I'm going to go into for now, because the rest are either batshit insane or completely fucked up. In April of 2021, the boy's remains were exhumed and his DNA was sent for testing. Now that we have a DNA profile on him, we might be able to solve this case. But for now, the boy remains nameless in Ivy Hill Cemetery, toys scattered around his grave. One day I feel he will be identified, and one day we will have a name for the boy in the box.